strange occurrence happened. A blue sky. And I was like, what's all about? And then even stranger behavior, I put some shorts on because it was hot. That's rare, isn't it? That was rare. So yesterday, I don't know whether you enjoy the hot weather, but I was just enjoying every second of it because it just seems so rare. Um, just a few things to add to what Peter said. So at the end of the service, we're going to need some help just setting up for mums and tots tomorrow. We need stuff clearing away, some mats putting out and some heavy stuff moving. If you could help with that, that would be great. Um, and the other thing to say is this, we, uh, we had a plan for the coronation, we done our coronation service last Sunday, was that last Sunday? Yeah, uh, and so the plan was that we would get some uh, tracks, for those watching at home, let me just clear off the screen actually, uh, we get some tracks and uh, potentially hand them out um, or post them locally and the tracks in it, it tells you all about the, the Christian element of the coronation of King Charles and on the front it's got God save the king. Amen to that. I want to see him saved. And, um, and so I um, ordered them online. No expense spared. Speedy delivery. I think I paid like £1.98, something like that, you know. And um, that was a couple of weeks ago. And they arrived Thursday of this week. So we've got a load of these tracks that we want to, <laughs> want to hand out. So if you know someone who's particularly patriotic, and you're thinking, you know, I need an avenue to talk to them about faith. This is, your, this is your flyer right here. This is it. It's got everything in there that is required to explain what the coronation of the king was, how it came from a biblical perspective, all the stuff in there, and the oath where this, the king has to pledge an oath to defend the faith. Profound and powerful. Clearly, it's just me that thinks so, but there you go. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We've got plenty of people to pray for this morning. Um, and so um, if you have a need uh, and you've not let me know, then the Bible says God sees your heart. There is loads and loads and loads of scripture where people have been forced into a point where they've got nothing left to do but turn to God and pray. And when they do that, God has broke out in marvelous ways. And sometimes God takes you there. Sometimes there's there's nowhere else to go. I've just, I've, tried, I've exhausted this option. I've tried this, I've tried that. I'm going to go to God. I'm going to pray. I've got nowhere else to go. And that's a profound and powerful place to be in. Uh, and so as a church, we've seen God answer prayer. Um, but I'm here to announce that the praying's not over, church. We've got, we've, we've, we've got to pray some more. And we're going to be starting Sunday night prayer meetings in here and on Zoom. They will start next week. Um, if you can't make it, then, you know, Log in on Zoom if we can get that work. But I prefer to do it face-to-face because -face I think there's a, there's a power in that as well, being face-to-face -face and praying. So we're going to be doing that. They will be every other week. So we're going to, on, if it's on one Sunday evening, it won't be on the next. We're just going to alternate and alternate until, um, until such time as we feel it's time to stop. Or we might say, actually, we need to increase them because there's so much to pray for. Um, so as we stand with me this morning, what I want to do is pray for various people, some who you know, some who uh, we regularly pray for, but we're going to keep Godfrey in prayer, who I believe is had a, a, an improvement. We're going to pray for Enid. Brenda, um, uh, whether you know or not, is in between lots of operations, etc., and she's just feeling very, very weary with it all, so we're going to keep her in prayer. Margaret Brown, who we've been praying for, is, it seems to be getting better, so we're going to keep her in prayer. And also we're going to pray for Rita's daughter, Lorraine. Uh, we just need God to work a miracle there, really. It really do, does need a, a, something divine. Uh, and, and also Jamie's mum, Sue Vernon, we're going to keep her in prayer as well. So if you stand with me this morning, we'll pray. Go before our God and trust that he is able to move. Father God, as we come before you, we know that you are more than able. Father, we say to you this morning, we acknowledge you that you are a God who works wonders and miracles. It's not stuff that we just read about in a book from 2,000 years ago. It's stuff that happens now. And we pray, Father God, naming these people that we've named, looking for your intervention, seeking, Father, for you to do what only you can do, which is a miracle, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While you stood up, go around and say hello to people, make people feel welcome, and be super firms of struggle. This is a struggle. 
It's a struggle of faith, he says. But the struggle, it isn't with those that are out there. The initial struggle is with ourselves. That's what he says. So he talks about bridling the tongue, taming the tongue. That's what he says. It's a world of evil. The tongue can bring life. The tongue can bring death. He talks about being quick to listen. We live in an age that's just quick to give their opinion, to tweet, to text, to message. Instant, instant, instant. James says, now sack all that. We are going to wait. We're going to wait. We're going to listen. Then he says, slow to speak, slow to anger. And he gives all this advice about how we as Christians can be mature. You know, I want to be a mature Christian. I want to be a Christian that has got all the answers. I don't think I'll ever be there, but I want to be someone who's got something to say for a particular season. And that's what James gives us, okay? So page 1215, and we're going to look today at planning, okay? Planning. How do we plan appropriately? How do we do it accordingly to God's will? James gives us some advice on that. So the bottom of that chapter, chapter 4, Verse 13 through to verse 17, it says this. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? Sorry. What is your life? What is your life? You are a mist. Don't pull any punches, our James, does he? Don't hold back. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Wow. Packs a punch, Johnny. Packs a punch. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. We pray, Father, that we honor it as being your word, that it is not the word of a man, but it is the word of the living God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Making decisions and making plans. Making decisions and making plans. When um, I grew up, <clears throat> I had a plan. And the plan started at primary school, and the plan was... I was going to be a professional footballer. I've said this before, okay? And here I am. You know how that one went. Okay, but I did have trials. I had trials for Manchester City, okay? I know, I know. I, I, that was the same. Go and have a trial for Manchester City. Don't want it. Now, I went and I played, and, and, and I realized that there was another level. But we all make plans. We have ideas. We have things that we want, and these plans, James is telling us here, need to have a certain ingredient if they are going to be what we want them or what God wants them to be. As my kids grew up, I had a plan for my kids, okay? Plan number one, eldest son. He's going to be a professional footballer. If I can't be one, he can be one, okay? So he went and uh, he played semi-pro, I played semi-pro, and he got to a level at semi-professional, he says, oh, I just don't want to do it anymore. And I was like, what? Why not? Come on, son, you're in your 20s. It's the best. You know, I, I was doing 20s. I went to play semi-pro and I decided to do something. I did it and he didn't want to do it. Uh, plan for Kieran, my second son, was uh, professional athletics. That's what, that's what the plan for him was, you know. And in fact, all of them were good at athletics. All of them were good at athletics. Um, Kira, my second son, he used to, when he was in primary school, he was in like year four, he used to run in all the year six races because he was so fast. And I was super proud dad. I've got loads of video footage standing at the end of these sprints with my phone and you can just hear me, go on, Kieran, go on, Kieran. And they're like, nothing else. You can't hear anything else. Me shouting my head off because I want him to do so well. One time he famously was running so fast around the track that he stopped because he thought he'd got it wrong. He thought, I'm so fat, I must have been doing something wrong. And I'm going, Kieran, keep running. Like veins coming out of my head and everything, you know what I mean? Because I'm just like in the zone. And so I had plans for them. Um, and um, my, uh, my daughter, Olivia, 
she, uh, she, um, the boys were dead good at athletics. And, and so I remember the boys, it'd be like, uh, they'd expect me to win the dad's race. So I'd go in training for the dad's race. I would do that. Um, and then nearly like bust a blood vessel trying to win it on their behalf. Um, and then uh, they would, they'd do their bit, they'd win, and then Kieran would win his. And I remember Olivia, she rocked up, and it was a girls' race. And we're like, come on, come on, Olivia. And uh, the whistle, the, the, the alarm, the gun or whatever, it went off like that. And she just turned and looked at us like that, me and my wife, and just walked. While her face was looking at us like that. That's what she did. And I'm looking at her going, you little rebel, you little rebel. Anyway, she later changed her mind and started winning a bit of stuff. But they, we all have these plans, don't we? We think, this is the way I want it to go. This is what I want to do. This is the, the avenue I think I'm, I need to go down. And what happens is that James is telling us that we need to include somebody, okay? And that person and that individual is God. Now, if you were to put me and my wife together and you were to say, who's the planner? It would be her. Okay, my wife, she's not in it, she's gone out, yeah. She's what? All right, okay, cool, I can talk about her. Don't tell her I said this, all right. My wife wants a plan for everything, all right, you know what I mean? So it'll be like Friday night, she goes, what's the plan for tomorrow? And I'll say something along the lines of, well, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to roll out of bed, like Saturday, innit, make a coffee, maybe, I don't know. That's as far as my planning. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, let's just enjoy the day. She wants everything planned. What we do? What time? When? Da -de -da -de -da. In fact, her brother, uh, one time was staying at a brother's, and uh, he, um, he's a military man, okay? And we'd, we'd gone down south. We're staying in their family. We've got the kids. And he said, right, I've got some activities for us. So we were like, oh, great. So he says, oh, we're going to go around London. We're going to see this. We're going to do that. So, um, so, so then he produces this itinerary of stuff, you know what I mean? Like our, you know, et, our ETA, you know, estimated time of around, your ETA will be this. And I'm like, right. So we get up that morning and uh, we, we go into their dining room and he's got the dining room table and he's got food laid out around the table. And I'm like, what's this? He goes, right, you start here and you walk around the table and you put that on your sandwich, then you put that on your sandwich, then you put that. Um, and I'm like, oh, right, so this is like a, a program how to make sandwiches. He's like, yeah, we're all going to make our own sandwiches. You know, my kids were really little at the time, Kieran, I think he was just about to start eating it all, you know what I mean? He's like, stick it in his mouth. So there are planners, and I've had to learn. I've had to learn to be a planner as a teacher for about 13 years and if you didn't plan, you were snookered. So I've, I've had to learn that skill. And it's something, you know, I'm still learning a little bit because there's a side to me that just wants to do, you know, let's just see what happens. You know, I'm, I'm, I've still got that about me and, I, uh, and I'm not letting go, even though my wife wants to, okay? So here we go. Life has uncertainty. That's what the first thing that, that James hones in on. Life has uncertainty. You can make plans, and it's right to make plans, but ultimately, there's an uncertainty to life. I mean, cast your mind back a few years, COVID, nobody saw that coming. Nobody saw us being told to stay in our homes, to wash our hands, to cover our faces and stay two meters away from people. No one saw that. You know, it was just out of the blue. And so life has uncertainty. And this is what he says in verse 13. Now listen. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. James is addressing some of the entrepreneurs, the merchants, the businessmen. And the first thing that we've got to notice about that is that he uses an Old Testament greeting, okay, which translators translate, come now, okay? Now you listen is the way the NIV translates it, but you go into the Old Testament, Isaiah 1 verse 18, oh, come now, let us reason together. Okay? So what's James doing? He's saying, let's be reasonable. Let's think rationally. Let's think appropriately as Christians. That's what he's saying. Be a good thinker. Think correctly. 
Let's think about our actions and let's see if they are pleasing to God. And it's interesting what he focuses on because he does not say it is evil to go and trade. Oh, no, he didn't say that. He doesn't say it's evil to go and make money or it's unreasonable to do those things. The error is in the assumption that we have tomorrow. Say that again. The error is in the assumption that we have tomorrow. And that tomorrow is ours to do with whatever we please. Jesus says back in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The assumption here in the book of James is that we have become familiar with all that God has given us and we now treat it as if it were ours. And guess what? Newsflash. It's not. It's not. Ray Steadman, an American preacher, tells this story. He said he had a friend in America in the war who wanted to go back to Washington, D.C., and it was World War II. And he wanted to go by plane from Washington to New York. It was in the days when you needed what they called priority air travel. And so he went into the ticket office and he said to the girl, I want to get a ticket to New York. She said, do you have a priority? And he said, I don't know. I didn't know you needed one. How do you get it? And she said, well, if you work for the government or for the airlines, I could give you one. And she said, I don't work for either one of them but I tell you who I do work for. I work for the one who owns the air that your airline flies its planes through. And she looked at him rather strangely and she said, well, I don't think that's good enough for you to get a priority. He leaned over and in his characteristic way, he said, did you ever think what would happen if my boss shut off your air for 10 minutes? She said, just a minute, I'll see what I can do. And in a moment, she was back and she gave him the priority and he said, and she said to him, you can go right aboard. You can't get much higher authority than that for God who gives us the very air that we breathe. And yet none of us get up in the morning and expect not to have the air, do we? We always expect to have it. The very air we breathe is owned by God. And yet we take it for granted that it will always be there and we will always be able to use it. Come now and be reasonable, says James. This good earth, these good gifts, all the things that we have in life, all of these things have been given as a gift. Given as a gift. Are you using them for the honor and the glory of another or are you using them for the honor and glory of yourself? Are you living for another? Or are you focused on what you can do to get yourself more and more and more? There's nothing wrong with earning money. There's nothing wrong with being entrepreneurial. But who are you doing it for? Is it for the one who owns everything or upholds everything by his word? Or is it for yourself? See, life has uncertainty. And all we are guaranteed is this day. You know, that's, that's, that's the, the be all and end all. I'm not saying we don't make plans. The Bible is full on about making plans. And we'll get into that in a, in a second. Point number two, life has brevity. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? Sorry, why? You do not know. I keep getting the, the pronunciation wrong. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes. That's not very edifying, is it? Or is it? When I was in my 20s, in fact, the younger I go, time moved slowly. You know, I remember kind of like teens, and, you know, you, you know you, and my kids were the same. As they, as they were little, they'd say those famous words, I'm bored. You know what I mean? 
I mean, I, I, now I haven't got time to be bored, you know what I mean? But back then, time seemed to move slow. And, you know, you get to your teens and you just seem to have a lot of time. And early 20s, there just seemed to be loads of time to just be able to chill. Now, whew, where's it gone? Where's it gone? I remember looking back, uh, and we've got some like holiday photos of the kids and that. And you're looking and you're thinking, I remember that specifically. That's like two minutes ago. And it like, it like 10 years. 10 years. A decade. And you look back and you think, where did the time go? I can remember the kids' uh, primary school. I can remember them in secondary school. I can remember family holidays. That's why we did them. Um, and yet, now they're in the 20s and one of them's married. And he needs to give me some grandchildren, if you're watching, son. <laughs> Where did the time go? But one thing I can clearly see is God's hand on my life, leading me through certain times, shepherding me when I didn't really know what to do. The Lord really has been my shepherd. When I, um, I think I've shared this bef before, but I met my wife in, in the church that we were attending together. And, um, you know, there, there's a decision in itself, isn't it? You know, you, you see, you see, you know, I remember going into the church and, uh, you know, you're looking around and, you know, and I'm, I was, I had the old, I was, the long hair thing was in then, so I was all, you know, long hair, down, up, down to there, ripped jeans, oh, it's all, it was all going on, it was all going on. And, I, and it was quite a, a straight-laced Pentecostal church, so everyone else was in suits. So I, I you know, I didn't really blend at all <laughs> when I went walking in. And, and so I remember going in there, and I remember seeing, um, getting to know a few people, and then seeing, she wasn't my wife at the time, but, you know, taking note, like you do, you know, the radar. You know, if you've not got a radar, you single men, get a radar. In church, godly woman, dink, that's the way to do it. And I remember taking note of that. And at the time, I was coming to the end of my degree, okay? And at the time, I um, um, was working for a, uh, an agency, agency work. So they phone up and say, I've got a week's work in, on the other side of Manchester. So I get on my bike, bike, other side of Manchester, about 40 odd minutes. Even the thought of that makes me tired now and rock up. And I remember turning up and it was a bottling plant, okay, for uh, Yates's Wine Lodge. And we were to bottle the blob. Has anyone heard of the blob? Yeah? The blob, you know, that drink, syrupy kind of drink. That, that, my job was to make sure that the bottles went on the, on the conveyor belt, okay? The skills needed for that job were this. That's it. That were it. That's all you need to do. They would bring the, the bottles there. There was a guy stood next to me, a guy called Paul, still remember his name. He had a big stack of bottles there. I had a big stack of bottles in these boxes, and we would go. Like that. If you wanted an exciting day, cross your hands over. Try and all sorts to keep, you know, keep, keep interested. And so I remember young Christian, and I'm thinking about who, what, the, this, this girl that I'd seen who eventually became to be my wife. And I'm talking to this guy, Paul, and I didn't know that he was a Christian. Okay, so just think about that a second. Young Christian, God puts someone right next to you on the bottle implant, making, putting bottles. And so I started talking to him. I'm going, how are you doing? He goes, and he's straight out there. He goes, oh, I'm a Christian. I go to this church. I go, oh, right, I am. I've just uh, literally, I've just become a Christian. Uh, chat, 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 chat. And he said, blah, blah, blah. I said, I've seen this girl. And he went, put his hand up. And he went, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything shall be added unto you. And I was like, I was like the voice of the Lord. You know, I'm like, all, all that was missing was like lightning. You know what I mean? It just like, it hit me. Hit me in the, internally. So I'm, so I'm, 
Now in, in thinking mode, you know what I mean? I'm just like, see your face again, I thought. Trying to process it. What does that mean? What does that mean? And I thought what God had said was, you will be single all the days of your life. So I was in, I was doing, I was just like thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. And what God actually said is that if you pray about that, if you seek me about that issue and make me your priority, then who knows what's going to happen? Who knows what's going to happen? Glad you're back in with us. Glad you're back in with us. James describes this life, you know what I mean? He says it's short. It's short. And the answer to the shortness of our life and the answer to this problem of our life being just a mist and a vapor is that we would find the will of God. Find the will of God. Now, by the grace of God, about a year passed when I'd had that bolt of light and I came back into that church. I was studying in Leeds, came back into that church, started getting involved with the church. It was all evangelism, out, literally out every night doing evangelism. And over a period of time and of a lot of prayer, I eventually asked who was my wife, asked her out for a date, you know, because I was like, uh, I don't know how to do this Christian dating business. What, what's the gig? You know, went to the pastor. Well, how do you do it? You know, because I know how to do it previously, but I'm not, you know, what, do we have rules? What do we do? So we did all that. And eventually she became my wife. Praise the Lord. Paul, uh, sorry, James tells us in this blunt language that life's transitory. This, this, this mist, it literally translated a smoky vapor or a puff of smoke. The point is, it is, short, it is too short to be planning only for this world and ignoring the next. Ignoring the next. There's a bumper sticker that I remember seeing, you know, like on the back of a car, and it said, he, he, he who's got the most toys wins. The point being is that if you get a load of, collect a load of possessions whilst alive on planet Earth, that is what you're meant to do. James says it's the exact opposite. Life is too short to focus only on our own needs and only on ourselves. We are a mist that appears, then vanishes. Seek God. Find God. Psalms 39, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days as a mere hand breath. The span of my years is nothing more, nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. It was God who breathed his breath of life into us at the very start of creation. It was his plan for us to live forever. We cut that short by the choices that we made in the garden. And now we have choices with the time that we have. Will I plan to use it for the honor and for the glory of the living God? In this life, God has sovereignty. That's his next point. Verse 15, instead you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Everything, if you want to see anything, rather, and you want to see that come to pass, then it's got to be given to him. It's got to be enmeshed with his will. It's got to be something that God, you give to God and God gives you back. If it's the Lord's will, we will live. George Bernard Shaw said this, the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one people die. Impressive, aren't they? You know, no, no flaws with that one. And with um, death having such an impressive resume, it's really, really surprising that we do not have more people making inquiries about life. How do you live? How do you do life? Planning and making plans are not the problem. The presumption is the problem. I've made these plans, Lord. Do you fancy getting involved? You know, it's the old thing, isn't it? Permission 
um, is harder to ask for than forgiveness. Okay? That was never more true than when Christians play football. Two Christian football teams, you have never seen so much dirty tackling in all your life. They'll ask for forgiveness rather than permission, that's why. And it's the same. If we make a decision, what we're doing is we go, right, here's a train, the train's on the tracks, I've made a decision, the train's going. Okay, God, do you want to get in a carriage and follow me? That's what you're doing. Follow me. Follow, as I tell you, God, what, what, what I think is best for my life. That's a recipe for disaster. God has to be first. He has to be foremost. And for that to happen in this life, you need humility. Verse 16, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. The theme of this arrogant boaster it recurs through James's letters, and it basically says vain and confident fancies that the future is certain to you. If the future is uncertain, if we accept that only God really knows what's going to go on, then humility is required. We cannot know what the future holds. We assume and presume each day will be like the next, that we will have next year to do what we want, but each day requires humility and gratitude. Lord, I have this day. Thank you. Let me use it for you. Let me use it for your honor and glory. Let me appreciate the simpler things in life, like having family and friends around. And what we constantly see in society is people who claim to know <laughs> what the future is going to hold. I mean, the classic case of this is your, your leaders. You know, next year, the, I don't know, the fuel prices will be coming down. You can guarantee that won't be happening. Next year, food will be cheaper. No, it won't be. Next year, follow me and I'll, you know, and they're always, you know, looking forward, trying to project possibly for the best reasons, possibly not, we don't know, and getting it wrong. These leaders offer themselves as prophet, they want us to follow them, and yet the only one who knows what tomorrow will bring is King Jesus. King Jesus, he knows. He, the future is in his hands and we are his people. And Jesus made this amazing statement, that if we ponder it, it is profound. Listen to these words, John 5, chapter 5, verse 36. The works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works are the very works that I'm doing. The works that the Father has given me to accomplish are the very works that I'm doing. Jesus is saying, I know the will of the Father. I know what it is. I know his will. I'm getting on with what he has given me to do. How many of us can say, I know the will of the Father. I know God's will. And I'm just getting on with that. Don't all raise your hands at once. I'm getting on with only what God wants and nothing else. I don't think any of us can really say that, can we? That's what Jesus said. Jesus says, God's will, my Father's will, I do that and I don't do anything else. How many of us do not know what God's will is for our life? Maybe that's something for us to pray about. Most of us, if something seems good, what most of us do is we'll go, yeah. Okay? I, I could fill my time with ministers meeting other ministers. Not a problem. I could fill my months with it. Go to this networking, go to that. Go to this evangelist event, go to that. Da, 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 da. And they're all good things, you know, that I, I get something out of them. But are they the right thing? I think what God wants. One American preacher who I like listening to it's, it's said, it's like this. He said, you, you've got a plate. In fact, I was going to bring some plates to do a sermon illustration, but I forgot. So there you go. You have to imagine. You've got some people, okay, and the plate represents the life, okay? And the plate's quite small, you know, it's a little, like a, hold a, hold a teacup in it. 
and they've got a few things on that plate, and they're happy with a few things, and it's quite easy to, to, to clear those things off. Yeah? Little plate, a few things on it, yep, sorted. Some of us have like a, more like a dinner plate, you know? And there's quite a few things on there, and different people have different capacity. And, you know, and, 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 and although this is a bigger plate, you can, I can get through those things, okay? Some of us have a platter. And we fill that platter up with stuff that we see and feel needs doing. And, you know, we, 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 we bracket it with this is the Lord's will and, you know, we, we, we're doing all the right things. But that platter is so full that we start to get a little bit stressed. Start to get a little bit burnt out. Start to get a little bit fatigued by it. Now, on the platter front, I am preaching to myself. Bear that in mind, okay? I feel like I've got a platter and stuff's falling off the platter. There's that much stuff on there. And I've got to look at those things now and say, what is the stuff here that is genuinely, you know, this is a priority for the God's kingdom and for God's will in my life. And what stuff needs to come off? What stuff do I need to let go of? Because that's what some of us need to do. You know, I recently have just started reading a book called, uh, it's called, it's a secular book called Deep Work. And it's just about taking some time out and as you take that time out, reflecting and thinking, having that time away and going, right, is this the right thing to do? Or is there something else that God wants me to do? Now, he's not speaking about God. He's just speaking about work in general, that you get away from emails and texts and personal messaging and social media and a phone, zzz, 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 phone going off all the time. And, uh, you know, he even advocates getting away from all technology. And just focus, get your focus right. Because there's loads of stuff I could do, but there's only probably a core thing that is really, really spot on for what God wants me to do right now. The works that the Father has given me to do, the very works that I am doing. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I know his will. I know what God wants. And I'm doing that. And one of the most powerful things about that statement is that Jesus, as many people as he met, you know, you think about blind Bartimaeus, I spoke about him last week. He met blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road. There's crowds and he meets blind Bartimaeus. He met Zacchaeus up a tree. As many of those individual people that he met, he walked past thousands. He didn't stop for everyone. Have a think about that. He knew who he needed to talk to. He knew God's divine will and purpose and plan, and he got on with that. And we find Jesus, even with the load that he was carrying, I know he was God, but he was man. That's a difficult concept to understand, both God and man. He was at peace. This week for me has been a breakthrough in that kind of thing. Peace, Lord. What do I need to let go of? And there's certain things I've got to put into plan and stop doing. And there, then I can focus and give my full attention to other things. We need to ask God, we need to start asking God, what's, God, what's going on the plate? And what's going to come off? And both of those need prayer. Some of us have that plate so stacked, it's falling off, and I'm one of them people. Jesus, when he came on earth, you think about it, 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 you know what his mission was? Well, obviously to go to the cross and die. And he trained 12 men. That's what he, that's, that was his legacy. To die on the cross, salvation for all of humanity, for all those who choose to believe. But he trained 12, 12. Like for the, for, you know, for, for the whole of the earth. 12. Why didn't he train 12 times 12? 
I just took 12. Now, there's a lot of symbolism there, but basically, that's what he did. He wanted to make sure these 12 guys, they got it, and they got on with it. Last point, we should have urgency. Verse 17, if anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Today is the day that we have, and the opportunity is there for us to do good. Douglas Moo in his commentary says this, he's urged us to take the Lord into consideration in all our planning. We are therefore have no excuse in the matter. We know what we are to do. To fail now after being instructed, James wants to make it clear that failure to do what we know we should do is sin. In closing, life is uncertain. God isn't. Life has brevity. Consider eternity. In this life, God has sovereignty. Claim that reality. He's sovereign over your life. Acknowledge that. Bring him into your plans. Give him your fears. He is good. And for all of that, we need humility. Don't delay. Have some urgency. I'm going to close in prayer now. Let's have a time of reflection. And then we'll invite Julie up to finish our last song off. Father, as we come before you now, as we bow our heads, as we reflect on the truths that you brought to us this morning, Lord. Lord, as we consider what needs to go on the plate and what needs to come off the plate, as we consider the brevity of life, as we acknowledge that tomorrow belongs to you, as we say we want to make plans, but we want them to be God-honoring plans, as we say, Father, we humble ourselves and seek you. And if there is an opportunity for doing good today, then give us that urgency, Father. Lord, as your Holy Spirit ministers to hearts, Lord, I do pray and ask. Speak to us. If you've not already done so, speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite Julie up to uh, lead us in our last worship song. Thanks, Julie. Am I on? Yep. Can we stand and sing? He knows my name. We all have a father. We all have a maker. And he formed everybody here today. And... He knows your name. Thought. He sees 
Blessed is he that falls and hears me when I call. Let's close, close in prayer. Father, we just thank you once again for the word that we've been given today through Nick, Father. And I just pray that each heart and mind dwell on that word this week, Father. And you remember you're a good God and you know our name and you know our every thought. And let us use this privilege that we have, Father, and just be ambassadors of God as we go out and just preach the name of Jesus name how good it is in this land today father in this land that we remind us so often that is broken and torn and hurt father and whether it's with our neighbor next door whether it's with our work colleague or whether it's with just someone we meet in the street father let us be like Jesus when he walked this path and the 12 that he taught let us go out there and teach the word that you give us father and show the love and the joy that only you can give us father through this week till we meet again next week father and we want to praise and worship your name as well and just thank you amen can we just be reminded of any help please just to set up the parent and toddler group in the back room